continuing my chapter summaries. Um, so again, this is this book, uh, fifth edition, College Physics by John Batista, uh, and I'm going over chapter two. So this is not reading the chapter. This is just the key points. Uh, read the chapter, work the through examples. You know, you're not going to get this just by watching this video. I'm not that awesome. I'm just kind of awesome. So uh, let's get into it. The last chapter is about forces, and we went through Newton's first law. Newton's first. Uh, Newton's third. So the first law says that Aristotle was wrong. Uh, if you leave an object alone, it will stay at a constant velocity. Aristotle said it would stop if you if you don't push on it. And then Newton's third law, uh, forces are an interaction between two things. Now, in this case, let's just jump to Newton's second law because I that's the key thing. Newton's second law, we can write as an equation. It looks like this. I'm going to write the way the book writes it. It's just to write it F net or sum of F. They write it like this. It says the sum of the forces on an object as a vector is equal to the mass times acceleration. You could also write this as, I typically write this as F net equals mass times acceleration. Be very careful. This is very common and very wrong. Okay, if you write F equals MA, one, it's not a vector. Two, it's the net force that matters, not just one single force. Um, so this says that if you add up all the forces in the last chapter, we looked at the, we looked at the special case, uh, some of the forces equals zero, it, that is a vector. Uh, but here we're looking at this case where they're equal, it's equal to an acceleration. This says that what does a force do to an object? It makes it accelerate and it depends on the mass too. So, but then now we have this big problem, what's acceleration? And we need to build up to that. So let's start off with position. Position is the vector location of an object. And we use the, the symbol R for this. So if I have an X and a Y axis, which does not remember where, matter where they are, and that is Z axis too, and I have some object right here, I can define its position with the vector R. So it has both an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. Um, I'm still thinking, do they, I should, let me go ahead and say, how do you write a vector? I write a vector like this, R is equal to RX r y r z so it has i write it as a component there's my x component y component z component i think this book does it like this r equals r x x hat plus r y y hat plus r z z hat so this just says that's in the x direction and this is the magnitude of that vector in the x direction the other way to write it as like this r x i hat plus R, Y, J hat, plus R, Z, K hat. So they just use I, J, K for the, these are called unit vectors. I like this one because it's just shortest. So um, so this does indeed have an X and a Y coordinate. And it, if I move the origin, if I put my origin over here, then my R value is going to be different. And that is important. Okay. So it does depend on the location. But what we really care about is displacement. So we call this displacement. Imagine that I go from here, R1, to here, and I missed it, R2. I have two vectors. We call this displacement. And we define this as delta R equals R2 minus R1. So in physics, the delta always means change or final minus initial. Ran out of room. Okay. Just so you know. So the final position is R2. The initials are R1. And so that's my delta R. And you'll notice that if I move my coordinate system over here, I have two different positions, but delta R is the same. So delta R does not depend on your coordinate system, which is kind of nice. So that's my displacement. It is a vector, okay? And we do have a subtraction here. And, oh, that's a vector too. So let's say, let's write this out just to be clear. If I want to find, uh, if I have R1 and R2 as this, R1 is R1X, R1Y, one 
R1z, and R2 is R2x, R2y, R2z. Those are all scalar values because I've already I've broken the component form. Then delta R is going to be R2x minus R1x. So I'll write that out, R2x minus R1x. Remember, because if I add vectors or subtract them, I add or subtract their components. And then I have R2y minus R1y and R2z minus, minus R1z. So these are all just numbers, but I will have an x component for delta r, a y component for delta r, and a z component for delta r. Now, we care about displacement because if I, again, also take measure the time it takes to move there from t1 to t2, and I get delta t, then I can define this as the average velocity. I'll write it out, average, average, average velocity. And we write that as V with a, it's a symbol, and I can put average, and it's the change in position, delta R over delta T. Delta T is a scalar, okay, and we can divide a vector by a scalar. So if I have um, A divided by B, this is going to be equal to AX divided by B, AY divided by B, a, Z divided by B. You divide each component by that. So delta T is a scalar. You can do that. And this will be in units of meters per second because delta R is in meters times in second. Let me go ahead and say don't do this. I like to put don't do things, right? V equals X over T. Don't do that. <laughs> because it's not the position divided by the time. It's not r over t, it's the change in r divided by the change in time. Change is super important. It's super important, okay? Um, now, if we start at t equals zero, then t final may be t, okay? But it really is delta t, and I think it's important to do that. So don't forget the delta t. Let's just imagine that I look at uh, a graph of, and we're just going to look at the x component, x as a function of time, okay? And so it's moving along like this, like that. And I pick some times. I'm going to pick uh, this one right here, and I'll call that t1, and it has a position x1. And then over here, it has um, position t2, and it has, I mean, time t2 and position x2. So if I write vx average, the x component only, it's going to be delta x over delta t, which is x2 minus x1 over t2 minus t1. And that looks just like the slope, right? So this is actually the slope from here to there. And it should be a straight line, but I, I'm drawing it in a weird thing. So v average x. If I let this time interval get smaller and smaller and smaller, so if I get down over here, you'll notice that, that, the, that this is going to change. And in fact, if I have a super, super tiny time interval right there from, from right there to right there, then my average velocity looks like the tangent of that line. So if I take the limit uh, as delta t goes to zero, which it doesn't, uh, then of delta r over delta t, I get what's called the instantaneous velocity. It's not an average anymore, it's the instantaneous. So if delta t is super, super, super small, as it gets smaller, this approaches that. Um, if you've taken calculus, that's cool. You may see this looks like the definition of a derivative. Um, if you have not taken calculus, then ignore what I just said, because it doesn't really matter. The important thing, though, is that uh, just like slope, depends on a change in position. Velocity depends on a change in position too. Okay, but that's our average velocity and our instantaneous velocity. Now we can use that to define average acceleration. I wrote that capital, I should write this one too. Average, average acceleration.
and we define this as how the velocity changes. So I'm going to say A average is the change in velocity with respect to time. So it would be V2 minus V1 over T2 minus T1. Now we're going to deal with situations where the average acceleration is constant. Uh, so it's the same as the instantaneous in almost every single case. So we'll often write this as just A. Okay, but it is indeed uh, that. And so this is change in position with respect to time in meters per second. This is change in velocity with respect to time, which is meters per second per second. And we'll often write this as meters per second squared. Um, notice that this is still a vector. So the average acceleration um, doesn't just mean you're speeding up or slowing down. Imagine that I have this v1 and then a little bit later I have this v2 I change those. So we can write this as a, a vector um, by putting these two vectors together. So I'm going to put this as v2 and this is v1. And then if I take a is v2 minus v1 over delta t, well this is going to be delta v right there from the end of v1 to the end of v2. Okay, And so that's the direction, and we divide that by time, the delta t, that's the direction of our acceleration. So the acceleration does not have to be in the same direction as v1 or v2. Um, it, we can deal with changes in direction. They have this thing in here, which I, I mean, it's kind of hard to show. Uh, if you have, uh, with, I want to do a different graph. If I have a velocity vx as a function of time graph, uh, and it goes like this, then if I look at from t1 to t2, the area under this graph is delta x. That's vx, right? So it's how far it moved in the x direction. Um, the slope of this line is the acceleration in the x direction. Um, okay, finally, mass and weight. Um, Newton's second law, which I already said. Uh, so let me just say this. Newton's second law, um, we wrote it like this. F vector mass times acceleration. We can actually write this as two equations. And I'll write it back as my favorite F net. F net x is mass times acceleration in the x direction. F net y is mass times acceleration in the y direction. And z too. Um, and we can pick the direction of x and y such that one of these could be zero. And that's what we're always going to do just to make our lives easier. Um, and, and so there's another important thing, because if you look at this, there are some cases where we know the acceleration, and so we can find some unknown force, or we can know all the forces and then find the acceleration. That's usually the two types of problems that you're going to have in this chapter. Um, they also have in this chapter uh, a thing about relative velocities. I think it's not useful. And I'm not, I'm not going to cover it just because it gets too confusing. And I'd rather just focus on the most important things of Newton's second law. And that's chapter two.